The title for my sermon this morning is How to Use the Power of God. As a speaker, getting an idea is always the hardest part of writing a message, at least for myself. This one was no exception. I kept thinking about this subject, and I kept coming back to the question, is this a message that is good to give at the feast? We typically, as sermon speakers, try to give uh, or have been given the guidelines of trying to give upbeat and positive messages here at the feast. Because it's the time that we are picturing is an absolute fantastic occurrence that is going to happen in the future. It is a time when we will all become God beings. We will help to set up the rule and proper order on the earth, the order that Mr. Rank was just talking about. As this earth is reeling from all-out destruction, chaos, and war, we will be the ones to help to bring order to the chaos that once rules and still <laughs> rules this world. Now that time is in the future, we understand that. But what I want to focus on today is for our time now. We have this plan and this future out in front of us. But first, we have to get through the here and the now. We have come to understand that God is a God of immense power. We have to come to understand what that means for us, not just from the perspective of a, a broader approach, but what it means for us very individually. We know that God's power is limitless. A few weeks ago, we heard a sermon from Mr. Gale and he spoke about the power of God in depth. And he spoke in terms and in details of God's power in creating the world, our known universe, creating the stars and the heavens, that little planet that we call home and earth, and the sustainment of it all. When I heard his title a few weeks ago, I was busily writing my messages for the feast, and I is, I'm the one that puts the messages together for the Sabbaths, or in terms of uh, the website, and I saw his title, and I was like, you have got to be kidding me. <laughs> it's like, I was, that was close, very close to my title. And his title was, The Power and the Might of God. And I have to tell you, as I was listening to his sermon, I felt a sigh of relief wash over me as he continued down his path as what we are going to, what I'm going to talk about is, has to do with the power of God, but it's different. So if you haven't heard that sermon, it's a very fantastic sermon. You should go and listen to it. And yes, that is a proper use of the word fantastic, Mr. Gale. The power of God the Father and Jesus Christ is beyond the scope of our imagination. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 20, it tells us, Hebrews 1 and verse 20, For since the creation of the world, the known world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Looking at the micro uh, 
microcosm of the earth, the tiniest little details that we are still learning about is incredible when you look at these things under microscopes. And this was all created by God. He formed these things. He understood how to make them. He understood how they would interplay with this world that we live in. And then as you zoom out and you see space and what we call light years away with galaxies. Myself, I can't even tell you what a light year is. It's too great for me to really understand. I know some scientists think they have an understanding of it, but do they really? An incredible creation that was created by God in Christ. The opportunity we have to see this creation, to begin to have an inkling of the power that they both have. It should fill us with an awe and a deep respect for the power and the creativity that they possess. No one else can lay claim to this power. It's his and his alone. And yet, he has placed with each of us, human beings, creativity. I think it's pretty cool that God has created man to be creative. We have heard already this feast that he made people in his image. In Genesis chapter 11 and verse 5 to 9, the early world of the humans, Genesis 11 and verse 5, it says, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing they, they propose to do will be withheld from them. When you think about that, God stopped what was going on for a reason. What they could have done in having one language up until this point, we don't even know. It would have pushed forward the plan of God faster than he was wanting it to go. And so he confused their language, stopped what they were doing. The propensity for man is to be creative, to try new things. Unfortunately, as we just heard from the sermonette, a lot of the times it's to do destructive things. While we as humans do create very neat things, <laughs> think of cars. I mean, that's when you think of how a car is made and how it all works together, it's truly amazing. It's something that human beings have figured out how to do. And at the same time, we make tanks to go and destroy people and things. If only we could learn how to do it correctly. Well, now that we have this as our general base for the power of God, I want to branch out and turn into the area which Mr. Gale did not go. I want to talk about God's power, but in the context of how we are God's called and chosen people and how we can use God's power. God has called us out of this world as we know. He has chosen us, each and every one of us individually. 
We have the ability to possess and to use the power that emanates from God and Christ. And not only do we have the ability, we have the duty, the obligation to use this power. Right now, brethren, we are only flesh and blood. We are not the mighty ones of the earth. We are not yet God beings. But we are on our way to that point. And we have to remember day to day just who we are, who God has called us to be, because it has consequences for us. It has consequences for those around us in a rippling effect. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and beginning in verse 1, First Corinthians 1 and verse 1, it says, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace to you and peace from our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Continuing on in verse 26, he says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has, called the, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That, is, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. It is to God's glory that we turn to him and seek him in all areas of our lives. When we do this properly, we bring our attention back to God and not to ourselves. And that is a key that we all have to learn as we live our lives. King David, I think, was a prime example of this. One of the greatest things of his abilities was to capture in writing how he felt about God. He constantly went back to God and talked about how God was in his life, what God was able to do. David was a human being just as we are. And that means that his life was messy, just as our lives are at times messy. And yet, God gave David power and strength to accomplish great and good things through his life. If you will, turn to Psalm 145. And we'll read verse 1 to 21. Psalm 145, David says, I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and your wondrous works. 
Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all of his works. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power. To make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord upholds all who fail and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them their food in due season. Verse 16, you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and gracious in all his works. The Lord is near to all of those who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. I love reading the Psalms and seeing how David thought about God. It gives good direction in how we, we can think about God, how we should think about him. You know, we, we as his people can go before God and we can talk to him in the same manner. David expected God to hear his prayers and to answer him. He expected God to stand by him and to accomplish the things that he prayed about. How often do we have the same attitude and approach in our prayers like David did? We have to have the faith in the power of God. A steadfast, rock steady, solid faith. David did not write psalms like this just because he did it and felt it on a whim. He truly believed what he was writing. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, we are told that without faith, it is impossible to please God. It says, For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Diligently seeking God means continuing to come before him in prayer, in Bible study, doing those things that we know that we should be doing. In James chapter 1, it says, verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Let him ask in faith with no doubting, For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. The rewards. While we can claim some of them now physically, really are more in looking to the spiritual. The spiritual rewards that we can obtain now and in the future. That's part of the reason why we 
are here, keeping this Feast of Tabernacles because of what it pictures for us in the future. We've heard this a couple times this feast, but we have to remember that rather than being overly occupied with affairs of this life, we are God's people. We are called to live a different way of life. We are here at this feast living in this hotel for a time as a temporary shelter from the world, under God's wings, if you will. We are seeking a better way, a better life, a better world. We are seeking the kingdom of God. We have to, we have to come each year to this feast as God has commanded us. We have to do so with a heart that is set on pilgrimage, as it says in Psalms 84 and verse 5. It says, blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. I've lived almost 40 in a couple years. I've been in the church since I was a baby. And it continues. I have to continue to live this way of life. It's not always easy for us, is it? We each have to come to the point where this means something for us on a personal level. And I think that's why each of us is here. It's because it does mean something to us on a personal level. We go through this world. And we live this life. And sometimes we get attached to this world and its ways at times. But this time that we are having together now is showing us very clearly that the world that we are traveling through is dying. There's nothing really good in this world for us. In order to continue walking through this world on our path, we have to learn how to use the power of God in our lives. It cannot be our own strength. It cannot be on our own power. God allows us to have use of his power and measure in accordance with our willingness to be obedient to him. We know that when we are baptized, we are given a measure of his spirit. And it is his spirit working in us that allows us to be able to do things that a Christian is called upon to do. As we grow older, hopefully more wiser, we continue to grow and we continue to be filled with more and more of God's Holy Spirit as we live. I'd like to turn to Luke 9. This is when Christ was talking to his disciples. Luke 9 and verse 1. And it says, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. 
And he said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there and from there depart. And whoever will receive you, there you go out. When you go out of the city, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Christ gives these men the opportunity to use the Holy Spirit power of God. They were able to go through the towns and do what Christ had told them to do. But if you will, turn now to Matthew 17, verse starting in verse 14. Matthew 17 and verse 14. It says, And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? They had been doing this and healing people in the towns as they were going around preaching, and yet, in this instance, they could not. And Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief or your little faith, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go except, out except by prayer and fasting. What Christ is pointing out here is that there has to be a relationship, a very deep and connected relationship at a level at which the disciples at that point were not at. They did not have enough use of God's power to be able to rebuke this demon. To really draw upon the power of God requires each and every one of us to have an amazing relationship with God the Father and Jesus Christ. When we pray, when we study, when we meditate, when we occasionally fast, it is for the purpose of drawing closer to God. In John chapter 14 and verse 12, I want to read what Christ had to say to us. John 14, starting in verse 12, says, I'm reading this from the Amplified Bible. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, Anyone who believes in me as Savior will also do the things that I do, and he will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name as my representative. This I will do, so that the Father may be glorified and celebrated in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name as my representative, I will do it. to bring honor, to bring glory to God. That is part of the purpose of our lives. That is part of the purpose of why we have the power of God living and working in us. Our mindset must be that we are searching out God's will 
and asking for the help to accomplish it. The power of God enables us to have faith. It enables us to have strength. It enables us to have conviction in who we are. In Daniel chapter 3 and verse 16, we find the story of Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They, in verse 16, it starts out, that these three men answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to answer you on this point. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. These men in their hearts, because they had a relationship with God, knew that they were either going to be saved by God, and even if they were not saved, in this moment, they were not going to back down. They were not going to worship an idol, and they would stand their ground even to the death. You know, it's easy to read these stories in the Bible and to think, man, that could, that could never happen to me. I won't be in a situation like that. But what does the Bible say? In Revelation 12 and verse 11, it says, And they overcame and conquered him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the world of their testimony. For they did not love their life and renounce their face even when they fear faced with death. This is talking about situations that may happen in our lifetime. Could even happen to some of us. In John chapter 12, verse 25, turn to that, John 12 and verse 25, Christ says, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am there, my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will will honor. The power of God enables us to live our life like this. Without this power, we would not be able to accomplish whatever is going to be required of us in the future. What can the power of God do in our lives? All things that we do can be done through the power of God, who we have working in and through us. Turning to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. And it says, This letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. This faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. Right away, Peter is stating that he is a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ. To be a slave to something means to have been found in doing what is required by the master. 
In order to properly use the power of God, we have to be in this state of mind where where we are willing to be the servants of God, willing to let go of anything that would hold us back. Keep your finger here in 2 Peter. But I just wanted to quickly turn to Romans 6, where Paul also talks about this. In Romans 6, and starting in verse 15, he says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are the slaves of the one who you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be a slave to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness, a completely opposite, different way of life. Turning back to uh, 2 Peter, verse 2, Peter goes on, May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. How would you say that your knowledge has grown in terms of God and Christ working in and through you this year? since last feast, let's say. Peter is saying here that it is God giving the grace, God giving the peace and the knowledge. But he doesn't hand it out just willy-nilly. He hands it out to those who are seeking it. Peter is saying, it is our job, it is our duty to be growing with God giving these attributes. If you go to school, if you are in work, how do you learn new things unless you start applying your brain and spending time and learning the materials to grow? The growth is in using the power of God as we live our lives. Now, we have no end to a lack of material in terms of the things that we put out as our our organization. Every week, we have Q&As. We have editorials. We have our weekly, um, I can never think of this word. It drives me crazy. I'm going to have to like write it down and just constantly look at it. Update. Thank you. Why can I not remember that? All these things we have as tools to help us, to guide us. Continuing on. Verse 3. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Everything that we need is there for us. God's divine power, it says. This word power here is dunamis in Greek. We also get our word dynamite from this word. This power is a power of achieving something. When dynamite is used, it's used to remove large amounts of dirt or rock blasting through it. It would be hard to build roads without using dynamite. So what is Peter saying here when he mentions God's divine power? What is he really 
trying to tell us. In verse 2, he just said that God would be giving more and more of his grace and his peace to us. What is being mentioned here is that God's power is equal with his grace. When we think about this word grace, what do we equate it to? Some of the words that come to mind should be salvation, forgiveness of our sins. Grace is also a free, unmerited gift that is given to us. It's not something that we earn. It could also mean the love of God. And lastly, what it can mean is empowerment. In Titus chapter 2, and verse 11, Titus 2 and verse 11, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. As God works in our lives, his grace strengthens us with the ability to live rightly, correctly. It teaches us how to reject ungodliness and to live in a way that honors and pleases God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and verse 9, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, it says, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God is telling Paul here in the scripture, my grace is all you need for my power. And it works best when you are weak, when you are facing human inabilities. Christ told this to Paul when Paul was asking to be healed from some of his health issues. And he asked three times, And yet God told Paul the answer was no in that instance. Paul accepted that. But he continued on with power and strength that he received from God, despite his physical ailments that he was going through. Grace is God's empowerment for us, helping us to go beyond our natural human abilities and our limitations. Continuing on in verse 3 of 2 Peter, it says, Given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who calls us by glory and virtue. All things. God is giving us of everything that we have discussed so far. God continues to give us everything that we need to live a godly life. And that, brethren, is what is truly powerful. That is something that is worth stopping and taking time to think about in our lives. It is impossible to 
walk this Christian life on our own terms, our own abilities. It is impossible to please God when we are attempting to live without him. It is impossible to overcome without God's power working in and through us. But it is God's divine power, his strength in us that gives us the ability to take on this Christian life. The power of God grows with inside of us when we put it to use, when we actively walk with it. In 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 10, it says, According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds upon it, but let each one take heeds how he builds on it. We have the power of God living and working with inside of us, but it is dependent upon how we live. It is dependent upon how we approach our day-to-day -day lives as we build our lives. Choosing to use the power of God in our lives, it is our choice. The power is within us. When we become baptized, we are given a portion of it. We don't have to wait for it. We have to use it. This is what it means to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We will turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter three, beginning in verse one. It says, Dear friends, this is my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words words spoken to you in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord Jesus. Lord and Savior, through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. And they will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of the water and by the water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will disappear with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of the Lord, day of God, and speed its coming, the day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and elements will melt in heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. Verse 16, he writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in 
them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and follow from your secure position. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. We are part of these people to whom Peter was writing. We are here today, and we can hasten the return of Christ by how we go about using the power of God in our lives. God is allowing us to live this life, to see where we will stand, what we will do, to see if he can entrust us with a full amount of his power as God beings. If you will turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Ephesians 1 and verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to his good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glory and his grace, by which he made us and accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the richness of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth in him. In him also we obtained an inheritance, which an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit a promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, did not cease to give thanks to you, for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you might know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him as right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion. And every name that is named, not only in this age, but is also in the age to come. Brethren, we have to believe that we can use this power of God in our lives. This is how we make it into the kingdom of God. This is how we make it through tough times, hard times. You know, when I think about Peter, when he saw Christ walking on the water, 
His immediate response was to call out to Christ and say, Lord, call me to you. And Christ's response was, come on, start walking. And Peter did. He walked on the water for a few moments. God's response to us, brethren, is come on. Use my power. Try it. Embrace it. Walk fully in it and use it. The use of God's power needs to be done in the conjunction of bringing focus again to him, to his honor and his glory. It is his power. We are his stewards, learning how best to use the power that we have been given. Christ tells us in Luke 16, verse 10, he who is faithful in what is least is also faithful in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is also unjust in much. The power of God, if we use it properly in our lives, it's a unique force that is unlike anything. And that is something that we can use and something that we can claim. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, it says, 3 and verse 20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask of him, or ask or think, according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. To all generations includes us. God's power in us, brethren, contemplate that as you live your lives. What does it look like in our life? And that is something that each and every one of us can only answer. My last scripture is Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13. It says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. As we continue this feast, as we continue living our lives, as we continue to grow closer and closer to God, let us lean into how to use his spirit of power, how to accomplish what is his good will, what is his good pleasure. There is a purpose for each and every one of us individually, and that is our calling. Let's give attention to that, detail to that, so that we can learn how to really effectively use the power of God in our lives.